Okay, Dr. Maxfield here. We're gonna be talking about witch hazel. Um, I've been critical of this, and not because it's, I think it's inherently bad for you. I just wanna make sure it's doing what you think it's doing on your skin. So we're gonna kinda of talk about what witch hazel is, a little bit about what it's supposed to be doing, how it might be doing what it's doing, and then how you can use it, and then also kinda of go over some products, not only that you could use that contain witch hazel, but also a couple of ways you can treat what you're using the witch hazel for when you're putting it on your skin. You ready? Here we go. The interesting thing is we were researching our niacinamide video. Uh, there's actually a lot of literature, a lot of literature to go over over the last 20 years on small studies based in lab or how people's skin actually responded to it. When I was looking up witch hazel, there was a lot less. There was a lot less. Uh, in fact, let's start our journey by going back to Salem and, no, I'm just kidding. One of the things I found was really interesting. It was a study from the eight, late 1800s. Late 1800s. So this is like, like 140 years ago. And they're talking about it in a very similar way that we're talking about it now. But they talk about how it worked in labs, how it might help wound healing, how it kind of decreased venous congestion in the legs, how it decreased irritation, how it responded when they tried it on animals to see if it helped them. Uh, and most of the literature I found now, 140 years later, looks very similar. So witch hazel is not a new product. It's a plant-based product. MML's Virginiana is the name. It's made up of four different major components. Polyphenols, catechins, flavonoids, and something called volatile oils. Uh, it doesn't mean that these are oils that are gonna explode, it's just a classification. But the two most important ingredients in this fall into the polyphenols and the catechins. And interestingly, there's a lot of overlap between something like green tea and witch hazel. Because of the polyphenols, the active ingredient, what's probably responsible for most of the action of witch hazel is something called tannins. Tannins are considered to work through primarily like vasoconstriction. So you're taking the blood vessels, constricting them down, it gets rid of the redness, and it probably decreases some of the irritation and inflammation because it decreases the amount of blood and inflammatory response that can get to a particular area. So tannins are thought to do the bulk of the work, but an interesting thing, a tannin is actually a component of green tea, a pretty prominent component in green tea. So if you're using green tea or even some black tea, in your product, you know, you're kind of double treating. So you don't need to be using a green tea based product um, as well as a witch hazel. Next are the catechins. So anytime I see catechins, my mind immediately goes to green tea. And yeah, believe it or not, this is something that shows up in our literature. It shows up about what is the role in green tea in different processes and specifically in the treatment of warts. So green tea and catechins, witch hazel and catechins. There's epicatechins, epigallocatechins, and a lot of different types. Um, but when you're looking at this ingredient, this is another one that can have some anti inflammatory, anti even microbial properties, I think, especially in the context of green tea, like antibacterial, antiviral. Uh, and again, so it's really the tannins and the catechins of this witch hazel, which are supposed to be doing the bulk of the work. And notice, when I'm talking about this, we're talking about decreasing inflammation, decreasing irritation, constricting blood vessels. We're not even really talking about this like an astringent. This is not like an astringent-based profile that we're talking about. So what is this witch hazel supposed to be doing for you? What are we using it for? So I know witch hazel fills a role and is typically classified as an astringent. So I talk about this in a lot of different videos because the idea of an astringent is like an expendable step sometimes because it's really supposed to remove whatever soap scum is left on your face, remove whatever's on your face, and get it ready for the active ingredients you're putting on. It can be used to get rid of oil, gunk, whatever. Witch hazel actually is a lot more. So in the dermatology world, we're talking about witch hazel as an astringent, as a kind of a cleanser, but then you switch over to our OBGYN colleagues, and witch hazel is used postpartum after childbirth to kind of decrease irritation after delivering a baby. It's also used, <laughs> it's also used over the counter in the gastrointestinal intestinal world. Uh, preparation H doesn't stand for witch hazel, but uh, yeah, some products for hemorrhoids also have witch hazel. So why are we using this in the space in dermatology as a pure astringent? Why is this commonly sold and marketed as an astringent? It, it's because when they're extracting witch hazel from the plant, it's actually often an ethanol-based, an alcohol-based extraction. And additionally, it's stored and often has historically been sold in an alcohol-based preparation. So what is this alcohol-based witch hazel done for people? Why have people like it? Obviously, it's been around since the late 1800s so it has something that people are liking and wanting to stick with. When you're using it as an astringent, we're really trying to degrease the skin. I think one of the most common things I hear about people outside of like the OBGYN world and outside of the gastrointestinal world when they're using witch hazel is they're using it to degrease and de-oil their skin. So then the question is, why is your skin so oily? Well, obviously a huge part of it is genetics. And then we talked about in our acne videos, there's no, very little you can actually do to stop your body from making whatever that baseline amount of oil is. But now what can we do? Two tricks. Although we can't decrease the oil that your body's making from the inside out, we can decrease the oil that your body's making reactively, the oil that your skin is making because it's getting irritated. So when you're putting alcohol on your face to wipe off oil, it works, right? It gets rid of the oil, but if you pay attention, you'll probably look a little glossy, a little shiny soon afterwards. And that's because your, your skin is overdried, it gets stripped, 
and is making oil as kind of a defense process. So what we need to do is switch that. This is where double cleansing comes in. Definitely not everybody needs to double cleanse, but if you're someone who wakes up in the morning and your skin is so oily that you feel like you need to wipe it off and a traditional cleanser is not cutting it, this is where double cleansing comes in. So what's double cleansing? Double cleansing is you use an oil-based cleanser, and then after you've washed your face once, you use a water-based cleanser for a second wash. And here's why it works. If you think about a lava lamp, if you think about a lava lamp, why are these two substances staying completely separate? Why can this colorful stuff float around and never just dissolve into the surrounding fluid? It's because the colors are made of an oil-based substrate, and oil just does not dissolve in water. So if you're using a water-based cleanser, which is usually really gentle on the skin, to dissolve the oil on your face, it may not be doing enough. It may just be kind of mechanically removing it, but not dissolving it. So if you use an oil-based cleanser first, to remove your oil-based makeups, just to remove the oil on your skin. You're gonna dissolve that oil into the oil-based cleanser and be able to remove it. And then you can use your water-based cleanser to kind of clean off any residue that's left over just from the oil cleanser. Double cleansing is not for everyone. It's pretty much, in my mind, only for someone with extremely oily skin. So that's how you remove the oil that's on your skin. Now, how do you stop it from forming? So your skin's pH is about 5.4. That's actually a little acidic. Traditional soaps have a pH of like eight. That's extremely alkaline. That's like sodium bicarbonate that you're just rubbing on your face. And that, or mechanical cleansers that just scrubs, can irritate your skin and cause more oil production. So if you switch to a gentle pH balanced cleanser, this is really going to stop irritating your skin. And then over time, that decreased irritation is gonna decrease the amount of oil your skin's producing, and therefore you're gonna decrease the amount of oil you're trying to clean off. So you can decrease the oil your skin is producing and then remove whatever oil is left if you just have really oily skin by double cleansing. And there are a couple really good cleansers. So I really like this low pH good morning gel cleanser. It has a pH that lives between five and six and it's really close to your skin's pH. It very well balances with it. And then if you need an oil-based cleanser, Bossia has a nice makeup remover cleanser that can help dissolve some of the oil on your skin. If you don't have skin that's extremely oily, you can just use your gentle cleanser, like the CeraVe SA Renewing Cream. So why CeraVe SA? So this has salicylic acid, it's gonna concentrate in the oil glands, again with the goal of treating it using some mild exfoliation with an active ingredient in the cleanser. Okay, so how's witch hazel done in the studies? Uh, there actually was one larger study uh, looking in, again in the OBGYN world of how well does witch hazel perform, and it actually didn't perform great as compared to something like ice cubes for relief, performed inferiorly. So I can't tell you that there's a lot of data out there saying that this is well, it does work well. Um, there's almost nothing out there objectively showing that witch hazel is a strong anti-inflammatory, is a strong vasoconstrictor, blood vessel constrictor, decreases erythema, is cooling, is calming. The question also is, is like, okay, are there, is there any downside to using this? Does it cause harm? And I'd say rarely. So of the studies done, even though there are very little studies done on like how well it actually works at decreasing inflammation, at soothing the skin, um, at even at causing vasoconstriction, there have been a lot of studies just to see how well people can tolerate this. So witch hazel, mostly through various patch tests, testing tests or putting it on people after they like induce a sunburn has fared pretty well. And I think that's why you find that people, especially in the professional space who are on social media, don't have a very strong opinion about this. Where they have been studies where people actually eat it uh, and see what happens. And really not much has happened. So I think overall, the question isn't like, is it safe? It's usually tolerated pretty well. If it's not, you're gonna get some irritation and stop it. Always try to minimize what you're putting on your skin, but it's not going to be, it's not like a robust photosensitizing or allergic, allergic ingredient. The question in this case is just does it work? But if you are someone who really likes this product, if you are someone who feels like you've had good results from using witch hazel, you've got to use the alcohol free. Alcohol is just going to overstrip the skin and counteract everything you're doing to try to degrease it. There are a decent amount of alcohol free witch hazel products now. There's a Procure witch hazel product and this one also is alcohol free, fragrance free, and can be used as a soothing agent for minor irritation and even for something like razor burn. I hope this is helpful for you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll keep putting stuff out there that I hope is relevant and helps you take care of your skin. Yeah.